number 34 of the 48 ways is Ohev et Hameshorim. Ohev means he loves. Es Hameshorim is the straight way. Now what does it mean to love? We've already defined it a few times. Love is an emotion of pleasure. It's a pleasure that we have when we see beauty or virtue or good in a human being and identify him with that good. That's the definition of love. So when it says, Oeva Samishorim, is to love the straight way, is to see the beauty, the power, the virtue, the good in the straight way. Now what does the straight way mean? Did you ever ask instructions in Israel? They say, Yasha, Yasha. It doesn't matter how many turns you make. You go, Yasha, Yasha, and then Yasha, Yasha, and then Yasha, Yasha. You go straight. Right? <laughs> so you've got to enjoy, you've got to love doing what's the right thing to do. All right, now, I like to use a focus, something to get you to appreciate what our problem is. And I'm asking you, look into yourself, did you ever ask yourself, did you ever catch yourself saying, look, I don't care if I fail, I don't care if I drop out of college, I don't care what the heck happens to me. It doesn't sound right. <laughs> you do give a hand. Yeah? There's something wrong. Yeah? What goes on? What makes us go off like that, a little crooked? And how do we straighten out and appreciate speaking on target? Right. Okay, so how do we go about it? Number one of this is realize that it's a natural attribute. The Torah tells us, Elokim bara et adam yasha, the Almighty, He created us straight. Vehein bikshu lehem machshovis rabbis. And man took to himself a lot of thoughts. What, what does that mean? We rationalize. You see, we would do right naturally. We have a sense. The Almighty gave us a gyroscope that tells us right on what's good, what's fitting. But we turn it off and use words, reasons, to rationalize ourselves out of the proper perspective. Okay, so number two is, in order to enjoy doing the straight thing, you have to hold on to your pre-rationalization concepts. The healthy first Thoughts. You have to pause a moment, introspect what is the right thing to do. So, let's say, should you treat everybody like a real human being? Right, wrong. Right. You say good morning with a smile. Right, wrong. Right. I mean, yeah, but people don't appreciate me. No, no, no buts. (laughs) Pre-rationalization, pre the buts, pre the, the reasons why it won't work. Okay, we have a natural state, okay, and then we start to build up, we start to rush around. Right. But still, when we're learning, we're changing constantly our way of thinking, and we have to, to mold ourselves again. And that's a good question. Sharon says that, look, when you're learning, you're changing. So if you use your natural perspective, then you're going you're gonna to go back with your prejudices. Yeah? So, Sharon, don't accept what anyone says. After all, people tell you, then how do you know it's true? We say that the Almighty gave us wisdom. We tell it in a story. The Medrash says that we were taught all of wisdom when we were in our mother's womb. We're programmed with wisdom, with natural wisdom. Our prejudices have slapped us out of it. But if you stay straight on, you go back to the original wisdom that's engraved in you. Should you treat your parents with consideration? Should you be grateful to what, they, what they've given you? Now, you are used to not treating them with consideration. Well, not you, Sharon. You come from Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, we Americans, right? We're used to not treating them. You know, it's a little different culture, right? But we're used to uh, bossing them around, uh, making demands on them. Do, do you see that? So, look, ask yourself, is that right? You go back to the original reaction. All right, number three is <clears throat> that take note and understand that this is different than fulfilling an obligation. It's a pleasure, but it's a different type. Now, fulfilling an obligation is, it's contract, it's I feel I've got to. The right thing to do is just that it's fitting and makes sense. Yeah? I, I, I said things like, you know, I was starting to be in the an obligation that I personally made myself. David is, is he says he feels an obligation to keep a clean room. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but does it, is it fitting? Should you keep your, clean, your room clean? Sure. 
sure. Should you have your clothes arranged nicely before you go to sleep? Makes sense. Right. Yeah. Do you feel an obligation? Not an obligation. So we will say, as a further point, number six, that there is a problem, that one of the obligations we have to ourselves is to have a job, to earn our living, and to do what's sensible. See? It is really an obligation to do what's right, because it's self-fulfilling. At the same time, it is the other way around, it's the right thing to do to fulfill your obligations. So you've got to use both powers, but they are intermingled. But we'll, let's get to that in, in the curriculum. So B of this is, see the difference in the pleasure. You fulfill an obligation, I've lived up to my contract, that's a feeling of strength, of self-respect. Doing the right thing, keeping a clean room, clear notes, Doing an assignment, starting to study at the beginning of a term, what is the feeling of that one? Sanity. Beauty. That's a, a nice shot into the basket. It just fits. Zing. A clean room, you feel healthy. It's nice. It's everything in place. It's nice. Yeah. It's like a beautiful swing in tennis. Yeah. Connect. It's graceful, harmonious. That's the pleasure. It just is a healthy way, you know. Like, if you don't, then it feels unhealthy. You walk into a room that's a mess, something's wrong. There's some, some worms around. Yeah? You don't feel it. You're weak and just out of kilter. Number four is, now that we understand the pleasure, so the idea is get some pleasure. So make lists of what's proper. Should you try to live in reality? Should you check out, make decisions? Is this valuable? Should I do it? Won't I do it? Should you be friendly to people? It's just the right thing to do. You don't feel an obligation to be friendly to, to your fellow man, do you? Good morning, how are you, how are you feeling? You don't feel an obligation. Could be I got an obligation. We're talking about what do you see? So use that faculty that the Almighty gave us, that intuitive recognition of what's fitting. Do a couple of them and take a note that I have pleasure in doing it. Do I feel better? Is it a more beautiful world? Do I feel more beautiful myself? That's the essence here, to pause and take pleasure in it. Do it with that intention. Number five is that with clarity, you will find that it is an obligation to do the right thing. It's an obligation to feel sane. It's an obligation to, to take care of your health. It's an obligation to earn your way. It's an obligation to be effective in living. You don't understand how people can go to work and not do a good day's work. You'll find a lot of things... You'll understand them to be an obligation. It's lacking in self-respect not to do it. You're not doing what you owe yourself. And everything that's an obligation right offhand, you know, is the proper thing to fulfill. Is it proper to pay your debts? Is it proper to live up to your contract? So every obligation is proper to fulfill. And everything that's proper to fulfill is really an obligation to yourself. All right, number six is that the proper thing to do happens to have an inbuilt difficulty because the proper thing, obligations are clearly spelled out. A contract is a contract. It's very difficult under contractual arrangements where it's spelled out your obligations to find a situation where you're not obligated to fulfill your obligations. There are situations. If there's a war and I, I promised to pay you the first of the month, I took a loan, but I'm in Lebanon, <laughs> go and find me. I, I, what can I do? There's a prior, <laughs> prior obligation. I, I, I'm fighting off. Uh, do, do you see that? But at the same time, obligations are clear cut and they don't shift so well. The proper thing to do shifts all the time. Shifts all the time. It's proper to keep a clean room. At the same time, before finals, to go around cleaning your room is a little obsessed. Yeah. Right now, it's time to study. <laughs> yeah. It varies greatly according to the circumstances. Number seven is that one rule that you should have is never stand on your rights. When you're looking at the proper thing to do, never, whenever you hear yourself saying, but I am not obligated to do this, I don't have an obligation to keep my room clean. It's not my turn to take out the garbage. Yeah. 
That should be a red warning signal. Forget who has the right of way if the other car is not listening, is not stopped at a red light. Even though you have a green light, you put on your brakes. <laughs> so whenever you feel, but it's not my obligation. I never undertook this, or it's not my, my turn. Stop. Correct yourself. Take a new reading. Do what's proper. Not what your obligation is. Number eight is, okay, in order to get to a good practice of enjoying yourself and doing the proper thing, what we have to do is eradicate machshavis, cheshbenis, rabbis. What we have to do is eradicate these many rationalizations, you see. Because until you eradicate the rationalization, something's telling you, yeah, but I don't have to. Should we tackle the third world's poverty? Is it the right thing to do? Yeah, but should we investigate as to whether there is a God or not? Whether the Torah was given on Sinai? A lot of people believe in it. Should you investigate it? Yeah, but. As soon as you see that but, 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 wait a moment. There's no real buts. Yeah. I don't know how. That's not a but. Find out how. How to investigate. So first you have to identify, and whenever you hear a but, challenge it. Number nine is practice at some of your most prevalent losses. You see, what is the most prevalent rationalization that keeps us from really growing. The most prevalent rationalization, let me focus you, is I can't. I can't find the solution. I can't overcome my need of taking revenge. I can't communicate with my parents. I can't keep my temper. I can't. I can't. Which is a rationalization. So, this is a way of dealing with it to show you where I can't is and how to deal with it. So, a fellow walks in and we say to him, this is our favorite we say, which would you rather be, happy or rich? He says, I'd rather be happy. I say, well, come. In Judaism, we say happiness is an obligation. Let us teach you how. You don't have to become a religious Jew. Do one thing good. Like every human being should be honest, even if he's an atheist. Every human being should be happy. A happy person is a better husband, is a better boss, is a better employee, is a better friend, is a better son, is a better father. Is that true? So let us teach you how to be happy. Do one thing right. The guy says, that's fascinating. I didn't really believe you could teach people how to be happy. That's fascinating. I'd love to stay, but I can't stay now. Can't stay? Why can't you stay? Why? Well, I had plans. I wanted to see Masada. Well, I can't stay now because I have a, I have a plane reservation. Now, if you... Hit the guy head on and you tell him, you can't stay. Don't talk such nonsense. I mean, so you don't see Masada. Who planned to see Masada today? You did. You can change your mind. You're not doing him any good because there's something in him that says, I can't. That's the important thing for you to realize. There's something in him that says, I can't. You're, this guy is just beating me up. I mean, he's just, but he doesn't realize, I can't, I can't. It's a pseudo reason that's in your bones. So the way you help a fellow out of it and the way you got to help yourself out of it is let him do what he feels like doing. He wants to leave, right? But tell him, look, don't say you can't. Say you don't want to stay. You got it? So now he still has this desire to leave, but he can leave because he doesn't want to stay. So he'll agree, of course I can stay if I wanted to. Of course, you know, I can change my plans. There won't be Masada. I can cancel my reservation if I don't show up with a reservation. It's not so nice, but <laughs> no charge. Yeah? So I can stay, but I don't want to. So tell him, look, don't say you don't want to, but give him an out for his desire. And say, just say you don't feel like it. He says, you know, Rabbi, you're right. I want to stay. I'm fascinated. You can teach me how to be happy. That's great. I'd really love to stay. I want to stay. Right now, I don't feel like it. So he has an out. He doesn't feel like staying. He can leave. Yeah? If you don't feel like staying, you can leave. Yeah. Now your, your reasoning is straight, you see. You want to stay, but you don't feel like it. Now you can focus him on what the issues are. You want to stay, 
You don't feel like it. Who says you got to do what you feel like doing? Why don't you do what you want to do? Did you see that? That's the issue. Who says you got to do what you desire to do? Do what you want to do. What makes sense? What is proper? What is fitting? What is powerful for living? For all your life, realize that you should always do what you want to do, not what you feel like doing. Don't wait until you feel like taking a final. Anybody you take a final? You ever take a final? Yeah? Did you feel like it? No. You feel like punching the professor in the nose. Yeah? And saying, I don't care, so I'll flunk. The heck with it. Yeah? That's what you feel like doing. But you do it because you want to pass. And you want to make sense. And you want to use your time. Right? And when you have a child... Don't wait until you feel like getting up in the middle of the night for a crying infant. Yeah? Because you're going to wait until you feel like getting up. <laughs> and the kid might get into trouble. You see that? So for the rest of your life, realize, do what you want to do and not what you feel like doing. That is what's good. Now, the idea that I'm showing you is, that's what happens with pseudo-reasons. You hit them head on. I can't. You're not going to. You're not going to do it. What you have to focus on is, I don't feel like it, but it will give me a lot of pleasure to do what's right. I don't feel like taking out the garbage. I don't feel like having clean notes. I don't feel like working on a clean room, but it will be a lot of pleasure if I walk into a room and it's nice and clean. That's how to lick rationalizations. Number 10 is, each person should write down his most prevalent rationalizations and track them down. Put them into the categories. It won't work. It's like I can't. <laughs> I don't feel like it. That, what is that? That's uh, so what? <laughs> That's just a fog. You have to figure out each one the most prevalent and then chase them away. So then you can get into this feeling of the beauty of existence when you just listen to your, to your perceptions and do what is right, what is proper. Power. It's power for using your potential. Number 11 is get feedback from your peers. Anybody will tell you, if you ask somebody, you sit here and I'm talking to you and I say to you, which would you rather be, happy or rich? Which would you rather be? Uh, would you want to know what the greatest pleasure in life is? And you say, yeah, that's fascinating, right? And I say, so stay with us. And one of you comes up and says, I can't. I say, why can't you? He says, I, I plan to go to Masad. Anybody in this room takes a look at you and he says, come on, get off it. Yeah. So then why can't you? Well, because um, I, I didn't plan to stay here. You say, come on. We look at the other guy, we look very objective. We, look, we listen to his dodge. He got to go to Masad. Do, do you see that? So get feedback. Yeah. A psychologist asks you the same question on maybe some other religious group, and it, you know they they said you know we can make you happy and all those things, and that part of you that says you know I'd like to be happy, you know, would say you'd want to. You're doing what they want you to do, not necessarily what you want. So how do you know what's really? A the want? question is asked: How do you know whether you're being manipulated, whether people are feeding to your weaknesses, or whether it's something that makes sense? Now, of course, you realize that this is a question that you got to solve before you get out into the world. Otherwise, you're going to be ripped off from your home, from your investments. From, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of con men around, and there are a lot of, a lot of uh, moonies around. You can't just stop your intercourse with people, right? Now, my friend, it's a very important question. So let me focus your attention. Somebody's telling you, join us, and you'll be happy. Come to Japan. I mean, we have a lot of fellows. A fellow walks through. He's on his way to Japan. I'm asking him, why are you going to Japan? He's going to study Zen Buddhism. I said, that's interesting. Zen Buddhism? I don't know much about Zen. Would you mind telling me some of the things that you learned from Zen? He says, Rabbi, you got to invest a year before you know whether it's for you. He says, so where are you going? <laughs> you know, why are you going there? you got to invest a year. I mean, you don't know whether you got anything or not? I'll give you a definition for happiness. Go over in the corner and see, is that true or not? I give you free samples. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to invest nothing. Invest a year before you know whether it's valid. 
So if you ask, how do I know, and you check it out, that's the way. So we tell you, look, I give you a definition of happiness. Happiness is just the ability and the effort to take pleasure in the pleasures you have. Everybody knows that you can have money, you can have success, you can have a wonderful wife, you can have wonderful children and be miserable. And on the other hand, you can have nothing and be happy, right? So, anybody here knows that if he was blind and somebody came along and did the miracle of giving him a pair of eyes, he'd be happy for how long? How long would you be happy if you were blind and you got a pair of eyes? A week? Two weeks? A month? Maybe. Maybe a whole month, right? Then we get used to it. But you've got to appreciate that if you get used to having eyes, you're going to get used to having a car, right? You're going to get used to having a swimming pool. You're going to get used to having your own Pac-Man. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to get used to everything. If you get used to having your own eyes, yeah, well, then you're going to be miserable. <laughs> you get it? So does that make sense? You check it out. So you say, so how are you going to have? I'll give you a drill. I'll show you how to take pleasure in what you have. You work on this drill. You don't have to buy the whole Judaism bit. <laughs> Just be a happy man. You're a better man. We'll teach you how. Now, you say, well, but still he's manipulating me. How much money did I get from him? Well, he's still manipulating me because he wants me to agree that that is happiness. Friend, <laughs> you agree, you agree. You don't agree, don't agree. Yeah. You know, what are you afraid of? Well, if I really get involved, I might become an Orthodox Jew. Look, if you like it, like it. <laughs> you know, we, we have no conditions, no strings attached. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody comes to you with an investment. You're going to make 250% on your money. What are you going to say? Don't bother me. You might be your con man. You say, show me how. Right? With money, you know, show me how. <laughs> what basically? Well, here, you sign these contracts. And it says over here. Well, uh, who, who are these people? What assets do they have? I want to go to a lawyer to see whether it's a good contract. Yeah? I mean, you, you understand with money, you know whether you're being taken or not. You ask some questions, you look for evidence. Do the same thing as somebody's offering you wisdom, meaning, happiness, love, whatever it is. Right? Check it out. Number 12 is, please realize that ours is a very crooked generation. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but this is the situation. You should be aware of it. We have prejudices. We're crooked. And one of the things that is only in our generation, it never was. When I was a kid, I never heard anybody say this, is I've never asked my parents to born me. Did you ever hear somebody say this? If they don't give me the car Saturday night, they're bums. Yeah? People saying, oh, I'm giving my parents the very best of everything. I have them in an old age home where I'm paying $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month. Oh, they're happy as larks. I can't stand there more than 15 minutes. I have to run. Yeah. They beg me to stay. Do you see that this is rationalization? You're not looking. You're not real. So watch out in a generation like this that you aren't caught up with it. So in order to do that, so number 13 is... A good start is write down the debts that you have without a contract. Now, in order to understand that concept, so I'm asking you, focus. Who do you owe more to? Let's say that you're going around, you're borrowing money, and you, you need money to save your business, right? you got a business, it's crucial, you need $25,000 to save your business, and it'll make a lot of money, right? And... You're going around one bank, they turn you down, another bank, they turn you down, and your business is going to go down the chute, yeah? Finally, somebody comes up, he says, all right, $25,000, 20% interest over six months. I mean, he's ripping you off, right? Write the contract, otherwise you lose the whole business. I take your home and your 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 children. <laughs> you know, he writes a teeth, her, a contract, right? And he lends you the money. Now, six months later, he's come to collect, yeah? You're going to pay him? Sure, you're going to pay. He's got a contract. You owe it to him. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't have made the contract, but it's your business. Yeah. So he rooked you, but he saved your business. You pay him up. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, what if somebody sees you walking around like this and you're losing your business? You're thoroughly depressed. He walks over to you and he says, you know, I seen you. You're working so hard. You built up a beautiful thing. I have confidence in you. 
Look, take my $25,000. You don't have to pay me back if your business goes broke. I believe in you. Here's your $25,000. My pleasure. Yeah? And some unbelievable. Yeah? Unbelievable. Six months later, your business is on its feet. He comes by and he says, you know, I, I really would like that $25,000 now. What do you mean you gave it to me? We didn't write any contracts. Do you have an obligation to give them the 25? Who do you owe more to? That's a moral obligation. It's no contract. Now, who was that guy who gave you the $25,000? No miracle. Who was that guy? Who? Your father. Is that right? Your father, you know your father would do it. And you're going to walk off and say, I owe him nothing. Do you realize that that's what happens to us? That's terrible. They took care of you when you were a kid. They gave you an education. No strings attached, yeah? I owe nothing. <laughs> I owe nothing. They gave you a car. They gave you food. They gave you... Yeah, I owe nothing. There's something very wrong. You're out of touch. So make a list of the debts that you have with no contracts. Yeah? Your father, your mother... Your friends who put out for you, yeah? your society, and your God, your people. That's the only way to be there. Yeah? Otherwise, you're a parasite. You're not, you're not there. It's just a moral debt. You've got to live up to it if you want a healthy life. Okay, number 15 is a good way of saying this objectively is always put yourself in the other people's shoes. How would you like it if you were a father and your son says, I own nothing? Yeah? And then you'll know your debts without contract. The ones that have a contract, <laughs> the, 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 the lawyer will come calling, <laughs> right? But the ones without contract. Number 15 is that the watchword for it all is straight. Straight means simple. No deviation. The first reaction. As soon as a butt rises, watch out. This is a way to get in touch with what we know. So the rabbis sum it up, and the rabbis say in Pirkei Avot, Rabbi HaKadosh, the writer of the, the author of the Mishnah, he says, Ezu derech yeshara. Shiyavo lo ha'adam. What is the straight path that a man should choose for himself? There's a lot of times in your life that you don't know what is the right thing to do. What is proper? So Rabbi HaKadosh says, you want to choose the right path? Kol shihi teferes seho v'teferes oto. All that is beautiful to the one who does it and is beautiful in the eyes of people who see him. All he has to do is get in touch. How will you feel afterwards? After the deed, will you feel the pleasure of beauty? Will people reflect to you the beauty of your act? You know what is right. We have this gyroscope. You've got to get in touch. And I want to focus your attention. The prophet says that here's a place where a person was in a quandary. Shoal was the first king of the Jews. And the prophet says that Saul took a dislike to King David for whatever reason it was. And king David was already anointed king. He was going to be the successor of Shoal even in Shoal's lifetime. He was anointed king. And Shoal decided he's going to eliminate King David. And he went chasing him with a whole arm. He went around chasing King David. In one place and another place. And David was hiding him. He hid here, he hid there, he hid in different places. Well, one day... Saul is, is running after David, and David is hiding with a small band of his trusty followers in a cave. And Saul wanted to relieve himself. He had to go for, uh, to a lavatory. So he was a tsenua. He didn't want to relieve himself out in the open. So he went into this cave to relieve himself, right in front of David and his men. So the prophet reports that King David's men say to King David, the Almighty, has put your enemy into your hand. Kill him. 
You see, because in Judaism, if a man is out to get you, you don't get to, you know, trial by combat, give him a fair... <laughs> no, no. If you know he's out to get you, stand in a corner and get rid of him. He's, he wants to murder you. David wasn't out to, to hurt Saul. He wanted to kill him. So it says that King David did not answer them. But he went over to King Saul and he cut the corner of his garment. With a knife, he cut off a piece of his garment. And it says, Vayach lev David. David's heart smote him. It hurt him. See, so he turns to his men and he says, Cholilali, it is forbidden for me. Lishloach yad, to stretch out my hand. Keneged Mashiach Hashem. Against the anointed of God. You see, King David, obviously, was in a quandary. The rule is, if a man is out to kill you, get him. That's the rule. That's right. But Saul is a different man. He's not just a man. He is a symbol of the Jewish people. He's an anointed by God. He's the king of the Jews. If you go and murder the king, (laughs) bad news. He doesn't know. But as I you're going to save your life. But he's the king. (laughs) Doesn't know what to do. So what does he do? He couldn't figure it out. He cut off the garment. He took action against the king. Wrong. The gyroscope went. Wrong. He turns to the soldiers and he says, "Uh uh-uh. I don't know how we're going to survive, but I cannot stretch my hand. I cannot do this. I'm not suggesting. And the Rabbi HaKodesh is not suggesting that just do what you feel like doing. He's suggesting you get in touch with what you know is right. And that is a perception. It's not like I feel like killing him or I feel like... No. Right, wrong. Proper, not proper. And it takes a little expertise to get in touch with that. But it's there. It's there in everyone. The Almighty gave us the wherewithal to know what's right. All right, so number 16 is that for dealing with people... Ask yourself, what's proper? How should you deal with people? Smile, give them a warm welcome, right? Warm. You'll know. How should you deal with your parents? Should you voice your appreciation? What should you do? How should you deal with business people? How should you deal with your boss? How should you deal with your workers? How should you deal with your workers? You know, that's where power corrupts. Yeah? Should you give them a good shot? Be fair with them? Should you encourage them? She's yell at him. You don't know what's right. You might feel like yelling at him. You might feel like bossing him around, but you know what's right. Do you, do you see? But you gotta get in touch all the time for living. You gotta ask yourself, what's right? What's right? What's right? And you'll get there. You'll see it. And then remember to take pleasure in doing what's right. You're opening up the whole of life when you do this. Now, why do we need this? Why do we need this? And the number one reason why is that unless you do what is fitting and proper, unless you're taking pleasure in doing it, then it's misery. You're working against yourself. There's something in you that's telling you, but but there's something telling you you're not doing the right thing. So it's it's a battle in life. There's misery. It's around. Even you don't study the beginning of the term. You have a filthy room. You're not doing well with your parents. There's a misery that's... In Judaism, we say it is de-energizing you. It keeps you from really flowing from the power. And if you do take pleasure in doing the right thing, so you get it accomplished, and you have the energy of doing beauty, of being healthy, of flowing. That's the first reason why. Number two is that in Judaism, we say that a human being can be a maneuver b'shusatur, you can fulfill all your obligations and be a monster. You can give charity and cut people up. You know, you can give a poor man charity and bury him. That's what the rabbis report. The poor man comes in, you say, okay, you filthy bum. Here's some food. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, you can, you can kill him. And you're fulfilling the, uh, I gave him charity, right? Of course, there's also a commandment, don't embarrass people. Yeah, but just by not being warm, you can kill him. You know, do, you, do you understand? By not feeling it. So you've got to know what's proper in order to really do things right. Otherwise, you can be far off even though you're fulfilling all your obligations. And number three is 
that it goes beyond that, that even if we want to do the right thing, without using our sense of what's proper, we don't even know when we're off. The rabbis give an example in the Talmud. The rabbis give an example according to the law, according to Jewish civil law. If I hire you, if I give you my tape recorder to fix, and you're an expert fixer, then you're called a shomer sacha. I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you 55 bucks, $150 to fix my tape recorder. If in fixing it, you break it, you know, you didn't mean to, but you break it, you've got to pay for a new tape recorder or a replacement. You follow? Because you're getting paid to fix that. That's cool. That's the, the law, right? So the rabbis reported that this wealthy rabbi gave a utensil to a workman, to an artisan, to fix for him. And the guy broke it. So the wealthy rabbi didn't ask the man to pay for it because after all, you know, he figured he's wealthy. The guy tried to fix it. He didn't fix it. So he said, forget it. Yeah. Forget it. Okay. So this artisan called him to the judge. He calls him to the judge. Well, he wanted to get paid for fixing it. He broke it. Yeah. He wanted to get paid. I worked on it. Right. So this rabbi comes into the judge. He said, well, look, I hired him to fix it. He broke it. I'm not asking him to pay for it, you know, because he's, he's a poor man. I'm a wealthy man, right? And this guy says, yeah, but I want him to pay me for the time that I put in, you know, 10 bucks an hour, yeah? So the judges rule that he has to pay. So he said, Dino Hoche? I mean, is that the law? I mean, I know the law. Is that the law? They said, yes, because it says, Asisa Hayosho Vahatov. Do what is proper and is good. The man is making a livelihood. He didn't intentionally break it. It's true that according to the law, he's obligated to pay you for the, but in as much as you're a wealthy man, so you should pay him for the time he put in. It's no skin off your nose, it's his livelihood. Now I don't ask you to agree or not to agree with the law, yeah? But I'm showing you that here, a man thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was being generous. And the Torah tells him, not enough. You didn't really feel the other guy. That's proper. Feel it. So if you really want to live, you know, you got to learn how to really get into what's proper. Okay, now an assignment. The first assignment that I'd like you to undertake is, listen, don't you think it's the proper thing to do to tell you, your parents how much you appreciate what they've done for you during the 20 odd years that you've lived. Now you're in Israel, you know, and they want to have a report from you. You say, you know, I was thinking about it, and give them a letter. Now, what do you say? It's not an obligation. They'll never expect it from you, right? Yeah? Why don't you try it out and see whether it is your pleasure? Right. You don't have to write the whole list, just, you know, ten good ones, <laughs> what they've done for you and how much you appreciate. The second assignment is, should you do an assignment? Should you do that assignment? What's right? <laughs> yeah. So you will know that makes sense. It's a good thing to do, right? Should be done. Now, but, but what? But they'll think I'm maudlin, but I don't feel like doing it, but track down the buds that went through your mind. When I gave you the first assignment, yeah, and lick him, <laughs> and lick him. Okay, thank you very much. You have been listening to the 48 Ways to Wisdom.